Kevin. Kevin Smith, welcome back. Happy to be here, sir. Always happy to be here. I, I tell you every time, I'm going to say it again just so we can give you a cheap plug. Yeah, please. Your Instagram is one of the most entertaining <laughs> Instagrams on the planet. You always have a rotation of famous faces coming through, and you make them do f***ed things. Yeah. And that, that is impressive. So I always like to give you props for that. We're going to do the audio version of saying, I'm doing f***ed up things, saying f***ed up things with Kevin Smith yes. right now. <laughs> um, in all earnestness, we're so happy you're here that you're doing well. Uh, I feel great. You've been through a lot the last uh, six months. You five would think, but oddly enough, like not. Like five months ago, I had a heart attack, and, and that sounds harrowing. And I remember in the moment, of course, there were moments of it that were like, well, this sucks. But it was not painful. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, wh when you're not in pain, you're like, oh, this ain't a problem. Um, when when the doctor told me, like, uh, you were, he's going, your LAD is 100% occluded. That means blocked up with cholesterol and stuff. And he goes, we have to go up there. We have to go up through your groin into your femoral artery and put a stent in your, in your uh, artery if, if that'll open it up if we can. I said, oh, okay, my mom's had one of those. And the doctor goes, oh, is there a history of right. heart problems in your family? And I said, well, my mom's got a stent in her heart, that's all. I said, plus my dad died of a massive heart attack at 67. And he's like, all right, we gotta go fast. <laughs> so they went in and when, before he did, he said something really cute. He goes, Dr. Leidenheim, he's my doctor. He goes, you're a comic book guy. I said, I am. And he goes, all right, that LAD, that artery that's blocked, we call that the widow maker. And I said, he goes, you know why? I said, no. And he goes, because in 80% of the cases of 100% occlusion, the patient always dies. He's going, but you're going to be in the other 20% because right. I'm really good at my job. Yeah. He dove into my crotch and saved my life. It was pretty fantastic. <laughs> so, so, but there was no pain. Yeah. There was, I know, there's, you never have those. <laughs> there was no pain. Like, you know, when I was a kid, child of the 70s, so I expected a heart attack to be like Fred Sanford's. Whenever Red Fox was having a heart attack, he was like, Elizabeth! He'd clutch his chest and throw his arm out real far. I felt no pain whatsoever. I couldn't catch my breath. That was the only difference. Yeah. So, it wasn't like harrowing, it wasn't bad. Only in as much as when the doctor gave me that information where he's like, you know, 80% of the cases, motherfuckers die. I was like, well, that's new information. I've never faced those kind of odds that I know of. You figure every day you leave your house, 50-50, you're going to drop dead. Like, get hit by lightning, hit by a car, or trip over a dog, then bite your juggler as you bleed out. You're like, but I loved dogs. You know, probably shit like 50 that. 50-50. It's probably more of a... Hey, hey. A little higher on that <laughs> yeah, one, probably. But, <laughs> but this was definitely, like, the closest that I know that I'd ever come to being dead. And... There was never any pain. So much so that I was able to maintain philosophy throughout. I was philosophical through the whole thing. You know, I was going, well, if this is the end, I've had a, like a really good life. Like I wasn't sitting there going like, Jesus, save me. I figured I had no point in praying because God would be like, you made dogma. Go f*** yourself. So I didn't, I didn't bother trying to plead for my life. Instead, I was filled with this eerie sort of calm where I was like, well, this is it. And it could be it. Like your 20% is pretty low and stuff. So if this is the end, how do you feel? And I felt actually pretty good like not like yeah I'm done I aced this right. but there was this weird sense of completion that nobody ever told me about the only person who came close to my mom my mom had died on the table once while they were working on her heart she was gone for like a minute and change and so I talked to her on, on Smodcast once after that I was like all right so tell us about it and she said I remember like you know I was talking to the anesthesiologist and then just mid-sentence I was gone and I remember floating I was like floating up she's like no floating like downstream and I was like, what did it feel like? And my mom goes, it felt like every responsibility I ever had in this life instantly evaporated. She's going, I never felt so free in my life. Right. All of my worries were instantly eliminated yeah. and stuff. So I was like, all right, so you lived in this best of all possible world 65 years. You were dead for a minute. Which is better? And my mom was like, I liked the other side. And I was like, why? And she's going, I've never felt that free, no concern, no worry. Like uh, Jacob Marley said, uh, we, we wear the chains we forge in life. My mom realized she forges a lot of chains and stuff. So it always stuck with me. And I don't know if it's because she said that or because I genuinely experienced this, but when I was on the operating table, that's what I had a sense of. Yeah. Like this weird sense of like, oh, this ain't bad. I've been trained to believe this is the worst thing that will ever happen to me, of course, because we all want to live. Nobody wants to die and we don't know what's on the other side. But I had this weird feeling of like, oh, I'm done, like I'm finished. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm done, I'm sad. I was like, oh my God, I got to the end. Like there's an end game. Like this is, I should be happy, it's right. done and shit. And I felt a sense of like accomplishment and also a sense of like, oh man, I'll never get killed in my sleep by a home intruder. Like I was listening, I won't get eaten by a shark. That was a big deal for me. So I was like, if I die here, this works out. And then Leidenheimer saved my life. So uh, I'm here.
does, my does, point. does it reorder? Because I would imagine that kind of thing can reorder personal priorities, but um, you know, apropos to Comic Con and your career, yes. does it reorder the list of projects and, and the kind of things that like, you know what, I want to get some certain things shit done. There is a bit of that. Like uh, if, if, if you've ever paid attention to my career, uh, you could look at it from the outside and even not being deep into it go, oh, he just fucking does whatever he wants. Like I saw that walrus movie, he's out of his mind. <laughs> so I've never been the guy that's like, man, if only one day I was brave enough to do the movie that I wanted to do. Like I've always left it yeah. on the table professionally, so to speak. And whether people like it or not, I can't do anything about that. But professionally, I've always gone for it because you get one chance in this life. Personally, I never treated myself the same way. Personally, I was sedentary. Personally, I was like, well, I accept this, and mm -hmm. this is what I am, and that will never change, which is weird because one day I was a guy that worked in the convenience store, and I didn't accept that, and I changed it and became a filmmaker. But when it came to my physical health, I, was, I just accepted. I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll never see my high school weight again or something like that. Right. So after the heart attack, you know, there was a nutritionist in the hospital, and they were like, what's your next step? And I was like, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, obviously, I don't want to come back here again. And the nutritionist said, like, have you ever thought about changing your diet? I said, I diet all the time. She's like, no, not changing your diet, like not dieting, change right. your diet. And, and I was like, what, like what? And she's like, well, uh, people that eat a vegetarian or vegan diet, they tend to have lower cholesterol. My kid has been a vegan for three years at that point. She's in the hospital with me. And she hears the nutritionist go vegan. She's like, yes, <laughs> tell him he has to do it. One of us. You know, she wanted me to, to join. <laughs> And so I said, you know, because I talked to Leidenheim, the doctor, and he said, uh, when I was leaving that day, because I was in the hospital for like less than 48 hours. Yeah. So uh, I was leaving. I was like, I feel great. And he goes, that's bad. I said, why is it bad? And he's going, because. He's going, you feel great. Look how easy we've made this. He's going, you know, back in the day, if you had this same heart attack, like we'd have to crack your chest open, saw open your bones, open your heart. And then the men time on that alone is something like three, four months. So you'd know you went through something and you would desperately change your life. He's going, but look at you. You're out in less than 48 hours. He's like, you know what happens to people that do that? They go, this is easy. And they go back to their same life. And he's right. like, and if I'm lucky, I will see them in here again before they die. But if I'm unlucky, they'll go. Yeah. So he's like, it's in your court. So at that point, I was like, all right, maybe it's time to do something healthy. And I figure I ate any way I wanted for like 47 years. So I was like, I'll try one year of going vegan and see if it works, man. Now, I'm a terrible vegan because I can hate vegetables. I don't eat any vegetables. So that makes it difficult right, right. away. Yeah. But peanut butter and jelly, vegan. You know, you have to find, <laughs> you have to find the little spot. places. Little, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I don't eat the greens, but I, I still smoke those. I don't eat them. But I won't sure. eat the animal food products, the right. cheese, the milk, none of that stuff. And oddly enough, weight just starts kind of coming off when you're eating plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been crazy. So that was the big change was professionally. It was like I went vegan, dropped some pounds and stuff. But, uh, I mean, personally. Professionally, it reordered things. Like, you know, we had this pol uh, pilot for Hollyweed that yes. we shot like two and a half years ago, right around the time of Yoga Hosers. So right before we went to Sundance with Yoga Hosers, we were shooting uh, Hollyweed. And we went to Sundance with Yoga Hosers, and Yoga Hosers happened. And then right after that, on the heels of that, Fremantle, the people we made the pilot with, they were like, hey, we tried to take it out. Nobody's interested. So all of January of 2016 was the suck for me. You know, I was like, this is the worst I'll ever be. And then I had a heart attack two years later. I had no idea what the worst was. <laughs> so there I am with this pilot that nobody wanted, and I loved it. Like, I thought it was fun. It's like Clerks in a weed store. And I had written the role of Randall and Clerks to play myself, which is why he has all the best jokes. And the closer I got to the production, I was like, no an actor I can't do this why did I write a part for myself I will take a part with no speaking lines and that was Silent Bob and, and oddly enough I didn't ask myself like I'm not a director why do I think I could direct that one I can get my head for whatever around. reason the acting part the acting one was tough man yeah. it would critics years later would be like you can't direct mother <laughs> but like in the beginning of my career you were right yeah you were you had no idea how close you were to right so I I scared myself out of like acting in the flick and then it went on to be what it was and I was in it as Silent Bob yeah. and that was fun but I always look at that Randall role and be like Fuck. like if I was in charge if I was Randall in Clerks we would be up to Clerks 29 right now <laughs> like that many <laughs> sequels so this is the way to get at that a little bit this is to do Hollyweed is for me to do Clerks in a weed store nice. and it comes full circle where it's like you know two roads diverged in a yellow wood and I chose the one path and, and boy it was great but now I get to come back to that same point and be like, well, what happens if you would have went that way? Mm -hmm. What happens if you did trust enough in yourself to make pretend with words as opposed to just using your face and goofy expressions of silent <laughs> pop? So Rivet TV came along. It was a guy, Marcus, that we knew from working on something at Fox back in the day. And Marcus was working at Rivet TV. And he had this interesting platform where he's like, what we're going to do here is take pilots that didn't go anywhere, 
put them up in front of an audience, and if they really like them, they could provide the funding, and you go forward from that. They could pre-buy a season of the show. So I was like, oh, my God. Like, I'd be way down with for that. Because I enjoyed making Hollyweed. And, and I remember when we made the pilot, I was at my then adult thinnest. Mm -hmm. So my logic was always like, if we were working on that show, I would have to stay relatively thinner. I would have to stay on the thinner side so I looked the same. So, you know, that was the reason to do it. Like, I was always sitting there going, <laughs> it'll keep me thin and I'll get to act with words. And then when uh, we wound up uh, doing a PS to the pilot yeah. for releasing when we released on Rivet TV... Because uh, Frankie Shaw was one of the characters in the pilot. Uh, she played one of the characters. Uh, she went on to do Smilf. She got her own show on Showtime. She's doing incredibly well. Yeah. So we can't be like, come back here and be in our weed show. <laughs> so we had to like kind of write a, a conclusion to her story, which included putting me on camera like thinner than I was when yeah. we shot the pilot. So like when we did it, like they were like, what are you going to do? How are you going to dress it? And I was like, I'll just make up a joke on the spot. And so while we were shooting... Donnell goes, uh, Pete, that's my character. He's like, Pete, you look thin today. I was like, do I? Thank you. I said, I felt bloated all day yesterday. I said, then I got up this morning, took a huge shit, feel like I lost 40 pounds. And so it, it's, it's kind of fun, even on the freak value, even if you're like, I don't want to watch a show about weed, to watch me go from one weight to another. It's your castaway, it. basically. A little bit. Oh, my God. That's, I'm stealing that line, Josh. It is my total Tom Hanks, man. It's my castaway moment. Is uh, where are you at in terms of directing uh, comic book stuff? Obviously, the last few years you got a chance to get uh, involved in uh, the Flash and Supergirl. Yeah. Um, is there a show out there that you'd like to explore? Berlanti keeps making there are like three more shows announced. Greg every day. Berlanti will not <laughs> stop making these amazing comic book TV shows. Yeah, I, I I owe him a great debt of thanks because he put those shows together uh, with his creative teams and whatnot and their casts. And they have allowed me, those shows, and, and Greg and his team himself, have allowed me to go into a world that I never really had much of interest in going into. Yeah. I love comic book movies, comic book properties. Uh, I love watching them. I love not picking them apart, but celebrating them and stuff like that. Love anticipating the next one. But making those things, it seemed like whenever you see those behind the scenes, they're like, we're on day 200 of Spider-Man. And you're like, who the <laughs> f*** could do anything 200 <laughs> times in a row, let alone Spider-Man? So I, it takes a lot more energy and attention and, and yeah. talent, most importantly, than I have. I like doing stuff where the characters talk about those movies. Right. Like, that's what I've been doing for years. So I like going to Flash and Supergirl because I get to then play in that world. You get to play with kids wearing uh, colorful costumes, having ridiculous powers, and showing off incredible feats of strength. But I love those shows more so than the comic book movies that they do because on TV, you get to pull the taffy a lot longer. You yes. get to fall in love with a cast of characters, know everything about them and whatnot, dive deep into their lives. So, you know, people always ask me, like, don't you want to make a comic book movie? And I'm like, nah, I'm not talented enough to do that. Russo Brothers, they can do that in their sleep. They know what to do and stuff. I'm not. I'm the guy that likes to watch that stuff, yeah. and I don't have the patience or the ability to sit through one of those things making it, and I don't know it would turn out very well if I did. A lot of people are like, you love this comic book stuff. Just because you love something doesn't mean that you're going to be great at it. Sometimes, particularly in the field of comic book movies, it's been interesting to watch people who are not from the genre, totally. who don't touch the material, suddenly interpret it. We saw that with Tim Burton, one of the greatest comic book movies of all time, 1989 Batman. Yep. Tim Burton very famously talks about, like, I don't read comic books. Um, who was it? Uh, Brian Singer when he made the X-Men. Sure. He was not a comic book guy either. So there's something to be said for like grabbing people from outside the medium who have a passing familiarity with it, not somebody who has so much invested in the game where I'm like, well, Thanos would never do that. <laughs> and they're like, well, maybe not on the page, but like we're making a movie here. We've I'm like, well, fuck that. three days arguing this, Kevin. Yeah, we have to move on. <laughs> That's what it would be. It would be me arguing on set a lot of the time. So I like watching them, but making them is not for me. The closest I get is when I jump into Berlanti land. That's yeah. fun, because it's nine days, and yeah. you're in and out. And, and also, when you make one of them big comic book movies, you have a chance to disappoint so many f***ing people. So many people. And I disappoint people on a regular basis with my own shit. Sure. So to take something everybody knows and suddenly disappoint them with that, who needs it? If I do a Flash or Supergirl, yeah. if it sucks, just wait a week. <laughs> Another one's coming, <laughs> and I'm sure it'll be great. What about, so Batwoman is coming, apparently? Isn't that Stargirl, fantastic? I was telling cool. my kid yesterday, she's like, Batgirl's coming. I was like, Batgirl's coming in the movies. Batwoman's coming to TV. The two different characters, let right. me explain. And so, then I went into it. So do you put your name in the hopper? Do you, do you text Greg and be like, that sounds cool, I, I'm available? I Last time I texted Greg was from the, well, I texted him a few months ago, but I texted him from the hospital the night that I had the heart attack and stuff, because a lot of people were sending texts and emails yeah. going, are you okay? And he sent one, and I wrote back to him, be like, 
I'm fine. I'm doing notes on my Flash episode right now because I was sitting there watching Flash and taking down like cut notes and stuff. And he's like, bro, you don't even do the heart attack right. You know, he's like, you're supposed <laughs> to enjoy it and stuff. So I would, I would totally reach out to him. I saw the trailer for his Teen Titans yeah. that they're doing on the DC Universe app, which, you know, like the buzzword of, of Comic-Con 2018 is Batman. We're going to get to that. Trust me. <laughs> Who it's, on knew? My, it's on my list. Don't you worry. It's crazy. <laughs> That's where we are right now. Uh, always a geek. Always welcome here. Uh, we love you around here. We're so happy love that you're doing here. well. Love being above ground. Uh, we agree with that. Uh, you're welcome here anytime, man. Uh, you, enjoy your Comic-Con as always. You and as well, man. It's good to see you, buddy. Excellent honestly. seeing you. <laughs>